Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Uh, took a quite a bit of time uh, today to prepare this message. It's extremely important. It's entitled, The Most Compelling Evidence for the Antichrist. And I really want uh, and pray that you will stay with me the entire duration of this message. If you have to come back, definitely come back. You need to hear it all. It is very, very compelling evidence that I've put together for you this evening. And uh, just here at the start of the broadcast, let me just mention this real quickly uh, because it is a lengthy message there. If you do uh, believe this type of broadcast that we do uh, and would like to be a part in supporting this, we definitely need your help in doing so. Please visit our website, israelinewslive.org or israelreturns.com. Uh, there's uh, an israelreturns.com under contact. We have our, both our mailing address as well as online. You can donate or israelinewslive.org. You can donate online. Thank you and God bless you for that. Uh, let's get right into this message though. Uh, I decided to take the time to work on this. I've spent about 15 hours putting this together. Uh, and I did it mainly because we know that uh, uh, President Putin has pulled back uh, the majority of his forces, or at least he's working on doing so out of Syria. Very concerned about that situation, what's really going on. We'll be looking into that as well. Uh, but a little bit of a lull there, so I wanted to take the opportunity to really expose the Antichrist here. So let's get going with the historical side of this, defining the historical evidence. Uh, now, we first we want to look real quick at the priesthood and how that was set up. That was, uh, of course, it was done uh, by God through Moses under Aaron, under his brother, the, Levi the Levites. And this is where it was first set up at. Uh, it was confirmed later through David. Uh, we find in 1 Chronicles 29, 22. You can also find this in the book of Kings. And he did eat and drink before the Lord on that day with great gladness. And they made Solomon, the son of David, king in the second time and anointed him unto the Lord to be the chief governor and Zadok to be the priest. So the Zadokite priesthood is, uh, is what it is referred to today. In fact, the Qumran community, community has been referred to by Jewish scholars as the Zadokite priests that went there. I've actually seen a documentary on that not long ago. It's very interesting where they say that the Zadokite priests were, uh, were at a war between the uh, Hasmoneans and uh, the priesthood, which were basically the Pharisees uh, that we know of, and that because of the differences there, the Zedekite priests took their, their, uh, their scrolls from the temple and went and dwelt in the deserts of Qumran there by the Dead Sea. Uh, so anyway, we see that there to, to set the stage. Now, the, the crumbling of these, of the, uh, the, the priesthood, the, the authentic priesthood that God had, in, had uh, purposed to be down through the ages for the Israelites uh, began to crumble during the time that An uh, Onias III, uh, who was actually reigning as the high priest of Israel uh, under the Greek Empire, and it began to be a problem for the Greeks. We see here, uh, this is from the book of Maccabees, a true descendant of Zadok was overthrown by the uh, Antiochus uh, of, Epip of Epiphanes, uh, Antiochus of Epiphanes, the Greek uh, emperor of that time. And it says in the book of Maccabees, but on the death of Seleucus the king, his son Antica Anti Antiochus uh, Epiphanes succeeded to the kingdom. And a man of haughty pride and terrible, who have deposed Onias from the high priesthood, appointed his brother Jason. Now this is Onanias III's brother, that is, Jason. Odd thing is, his name actually was uh, Yeshua to start with, but he changed it to Jason to Hellenize it. Uh, I guess to kind of make the priest all happy there. He said, who had made a covenant if he would give him this authority. Now, this is what uh, Antiochus made this covenant with him. If he gave, him, gave Jason the authority to be the high priest, uh, that he would pay yearly 3,660 talents and committed unto him the high priesthood and rulership of the nation. And he both changed the manner of life of the people and perverted their civil customs into lawlessness. This is what Jason did. And I see now he's still part of the uh, Zadokite uh, dynasty of priests, but he's already corrupting it 
And then finally, it'll be taken from his hands as well and given over to a high priest that is not of the Zadokite priests, not a descendant of Aaron whatsoever. Now, but this brought to my attention, it brought the, the, the scripture here in the book of Maccabees where it says he perverted their civil customs into all lawlessness made me think of the scripture from the book of Daniel. Daniel sees his people again as the sons of the lawless making a covenant with Rome. Now, you're going to see that a covenant does get made with Rome as well, but before it does, it's still with the Greeks at this time. But Daniel speaks of a very interesting prophecy. He says in chapter 11, verse 14, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Now the word there for the robbers of thy people, uva ne si amcha, literally means the sons of lawlessness of your people. See, Daniel's people, the sons of the lawlessness. Now we find out the lawless, when we, when we look back at what was happening with Antiochus, when Jason took the place was because they changed the manner of the life of the people and perverted their civil customs. See, God said to the Jewish people, don't make any covenants with, your, with these enemies of yours. And Rome is a huge enemy of Israel. This is Esau's descendants. That can easily be determined by the book of Obadiah. You don't have to go any further than the book of Obadiah and the book of Daniel. Daniel says that the one that destroyed the temple and sanctuary, that the prince that shall come would be of the people that destroy the temple and the sanctuary. That's Titus the Roman general. Now there's many that try to argue and say, well, Steve, you know that uh, Titus, it wasn't really him, it was the Syrians that did it. Well, Obadiah clarifies that too when he says it was Edom, and he said you, stand, you stood aside as one of them, you stood aloof in fact, you stood aloof as one of them while your brother was ransacked, just paraphrasing, and his treasures were carried away, and of course they were carried away to Rome. So it clearly identifies who it is. Now the sons of the lawless, according to Daniel eleven fourteen, 14, are people like Shimon Perez, who did do what? Na, na, uh, excuse me, na, nas, Nasau, which is to marry the vision. What vision are they trying to marry? Well, this is where the Bible speaks about that the law would go out of Jerusalem. See, the commandment of the Lord. The, see, God, is there will be a reigning from Jerusalem. So the Pope of Rome really thinks that he is the vicar of Christ. He thinks that he belongs in Jerusalem and that he is to reign from Jerusalem. Hello, is anybody wondering where the Antichrist is? I mean, I'm really beginning to wonder if people are still so delusional to believe that somebody like Obama is the Antichrist. No, Obama is not the Antichrist. Now, did the Pope of Rome, Pope John Paul II, did say that New York was the capital of the world. And Mayor uh, Gu uh, Gu excuse me, Giuliani likes to quote that quite often. In fact, he said one time to one of his critics, if you don't like me saying that, that uh, New York is the capital of the world, then take it up with the Pope. He's the one that said it. That was back in 1996, in case you're wondering about the timing of that. Uh, and why did the Pope say that New York is the capital of the world? Well, none other than the United Nations, where he runs his, his governmental side of his business, is ran from New York. So yes, that is the capital for the United Nations. But anyway, the lawless of your people, and of course in the autobiography of, uh, of uh, Yitzhak Rabin, he noted that Shimon Perez went to a Jesuit school back in uh, Poland. So he's definitely part of the lawless of our people, no doubt. So Antiochus IV of Epiphanes, this is in the BibleHistory.com, says, was the eighth ruler of the Seleucid, Seleucid Empire. He gave himself the surname Epiphanes, which means the visible God. So it's starting to sound more like the Pope of Rome all the time. You know, he is the vicar of Christ, according to Catholic creed, and that means he is in place of the Son of God. In fact, it says on the Triple Crown, vicarious filiadilia, which means instead of the Son of God. He is the visible presence of God on earth, in other words, just like the pharaohs of Rome, in fact. No wonder why 
uh, that Antiochus gave himself the title of Epiphanes. He wanted to be the visible God, just like the pharaohs of Egypt. No wonder why they were down in Egypt as well. He was practicing his godship, I guess you might say. Of course, we do know the Romans conquer the Greeks, of course, because Rome's not going to allow the Greeks to rule the world. They're going to be the ones to rule the world. Anyway, uh, Antiochus also, he acted though as though he really were Jupiter, and the people called him uh, Epimanes, which meaning the madman. He was violently bitter against the Jews and was determined to exterminate them and their religion. He devastated Jerusalem in 168 CE, defiled the temple, ordered a pig on, the, on its altar, erected an altar to Jupiter, and prohibited the temple worship. That sounds like the Catholic Church's history, doesn't it to me? It does to me anyway, including the part about Jupiter. Now, let me just say this, though. The Catholic Church has been very much behind trying to annihilate the Jews. And they've been behind it, especially the Inquisition. My own family, the Danoon family that was Benoon originally, which is what my legal name is now because we changed it, uh, had to change their names to Dinun, still meant the same thing, son of Nun, which we are supposedly descendants of Joshua. But uh, we changed our name to Dinun because of the Spanish Inquisition, where the Catholic Church was killing all the Jews from northern Africa and those places there, which is where my family came from, Morocco, and ended up moving into France, uh, move, changing our name from Benun to Dinun in order to try to hide that identity. Of course, when I was born, I was given my sister's father's name, totally different from either one altogether, but my mother did tell me who I really was, and then I went in search of my father and found him later in life. Um, moving right on, though, images of the Roman Catholic Church. This is uh, on MindSerpent.com. Now, the photograph is one that uh, me and my wife took ourselves. I don't know if she took it or I took it, uh, of the statue of Jupiter that's in St. Peter's Basilica. Says note, and I uh, says the statue of the gods from the Pantheon are now found in the Vatican Museum, with the exception of the great statue of Jupiter. Of course, we photographed all these statues, all the statues that were in the Pantheon, and of course, my wife did a video. You can see that on her channel, Rise Women of God, where she actually did a video about those gods that are uh, that are there at the Vatican in their museum. But the but the statue of Jupiter that was in the Pantheon, the great uh, temple of the gods uh, of the uh, uh, of astrology. Uh, in fact, it's kind of interesting. It's why you see the Vatican so interested in the stars themselves. And nothing wrong with being interested in the stars, but they worship the host of heaven is why. Uh, but anyway, it says, Jupiter has been modified, retitled, and seated on a throne in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome as St. Peter. Thousands of pilgrims kiss the foot of Jupiter while thinking it's the statue of Peter. In fact, they practically rubbed its foot off on the left foot there. Uh, when you're facing it, it'd be the right foot, but when he's sitting down, it'd be his left foot there. Very interesting. Now, remember, as I said, Jupiter, this is what Antiochus did. He erected an altar uh, for Jupiter. Well, the popes of Rome actually put the statue of Jupiter and called it St. Peter. Uh, more of the Mithras practices there during the time of Constantine, I would have to say. Well, moving right along, overthrow of the Hellenistic priesthood. This is the one thing that was definitely uh, coming, uh, and this is what we're looking at is the, remember, the true uh, Zadokite priesthood, which is from the uh, from Aaron's, Aaron's lineage. The Levites are the true uh, heirs to the priesthood. It's the way God intended it to be, never to be changed, but it was changed. Now, this is from the overthrow of the Hellenistic priesthood. Hellenistic priest Jason was a traitor to the true priesthood and sold out uh, God for money. Notice what it says here. Maccabees founded the Hasmonean dynasty, which ruled from 164 BCE to 63 BCE. They represented the Jewish religion partly by forced conversion, expanded the boundaries of Judea by conquest, and reduced the influence of the Hellenism and the Hellenistic Judaism. Hellenistic Judaism was formed by Jason, the brother of Onias III, corrupting the true Zadokite priesthood. But he was since replaced by Menelaus, uh, who was not even a member of the priestly family. So this is really when it got broken. Now the Maccabees these brothers that came up and fought the rebellion, in fact, it was a 25-year-long uh, battle that they did to overthrow 
the Hellenistic way that it, where it had gotten corrupted. But what happens is Jonathan Maccabee later, he, he elevates himself to high priest, and they're not even of the Levitical family. So what in the world is going on? I mean, as good as they did to, 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 to liberate the Jewish people from under the hand of the, uh, of the Greek empire, they did get to rule uh, self-autonomy, but they corrupted the priesthood, went completely away from what the Zadokite priests really stood for. And uh, instead of reestablishing the Zadokite priesthood back in the way it should have been, they allowed this to happen. And of course, when you do something like that, guess what? The covenant with Rome is inevitable. Let's continue on right here. This is under Ideas of Issues of the Bible by Bruce Metzger. He said, a scene largely due to the discovery of this, he scrolls at Qumran. Uh, this is from his book, by the way, Ideas and Issues of the Bible. Uh, the Essene, uh, largely due to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, the best known group from ancient sources is the Essenes. Now, this is the reason why I'm bringing this out right here from Bruce's book here, and there's many different documentations for this, is because the Zadokite priests, as I said earlier, the documentary that I watched uh, that was uh, done by, the, by a Jewish scholar, uh, as the lady that was doing that spoke about the Zadokite priest that came from um, uh, the, the, the temple. They gathered their books and they went down to the Qumran community. Now, this particular scholar that I watched disagrees that it's an Essene community. But there is a lot of edge, uh, evidence that suggests otherwise. But nonetheless, it is a fact agreed upon both by uh, this author here, as well as many of the ancient uh, scholars and historians as well, that it was the Zadokite priest. Nonetheless, they still all agree that it was Zadokite priest. But let's look at what he says here. The identification of the Qumran community with Essenes is not found in the scrolls. Rather, the impressive agreement, agreement of evidence in the scrolls with that of the other key sources for the Essenes, the Roman geographer Pliny, the elder Philo, and Josephus makes highly probable that the identification of the Qumran community as a scenes. Still, discrepancies remain, and the portrait that emerges is far from complete, but both Philo and Josephus number the Essenes at more than uh, uh, 4,000 and say that the Essene communities were found throughout Palestine. Uh, Pliny locates a major settlement on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea between Jericho and Engedi. All right. Now, Pliny, keep in mind, Pliny is actually a church father, uh, also a, considered a historian from his time during the first century. So he was actually alive during the time of the apostles. Uh, now, they, they use a different name for the word Essene. The, uh, Bruce uses the word Essene in his book there. The word sounds nearly exactly the same, but it is it's the Greek word for Essenes versus uh, what he's using here in English. Um, Anyway, though, they also bring out that there were communities in Damascus, uh, which was actually part of Manassas, or just north of Manassas territory as well. Uh, another interesting thing here, the ancient Christian historian uh, Epiphanius in, in his Panarion wrote this. Now, this is why, uh, what I'm gonna share with you here this is why I believe that the Catholic Church, their scholars, along with the Jewish scholars, are not wanting the world to know that the Zadokite priests of the Qumran community were actually Essenes. And it has a lot to do with what Epiphanius wrote uh, of his own writings here about this particular group that was there at Qumran. He calls it the Nazarene. He says they were Jews by nationality originally from the Gileadites, uh, where the early followers of Yeshua fled after the martyrdom of James, the Lord's brother. Bashanitas and the Transjordan, they acknowledged Moses and believed that he had received laws. Not this law, however, but some other. And so they were Jews who kept all the Jewish observances, but they would not offer sacrifice or meat. They considered it unlawful to eat meat or make sacrifices with it. They claim that these books are fiction and that none of these customs were instituted by the fathers. This was the difference between the Nazarene and the others. Panarian 
After his Nazarene sect in turn comes another closely connected with them called the Ossinians, or Ossinians. That's the actual the word for Essenes. These are Jews likely the former. Originally came from the Nabataea, uh, Itia, Damascus, where the teacher of righteous took those spoken of the Damascus covenant. Mobitus and Aurelius, the land beyond the, the basin of what sacred scripture called the Salt Sea. Though it is different from the other six of those seven sects, it causes schisms only by forbidding the books of Moses like the Nazarene. Now, this, this was written by uh, Epiphanius uh, in his Panarion. You have to understand, this man here is from around the 5th century. He was a staunch, dyed-in-the-wool Catholic priest. And the issue that comes in here, and this is the reason why, uh, because another part here that's not in this section that I wrote here, that he actually writes uh, that they do have the books of Moses that were actually written. Now that makes me wonder if uh, the, the, those that did the, the Qumran scrolls didn't end up hiding what, the, what some of these fragments really did uh, contain. And I think it's also the reason why they do not want you to believe that it's anything other than the Zadokite priest. Uh, the Zadokite priests just were known by different names is from what it looks like to me. Uh, and, and there again, it would go along with where Jeremiah also speaks of the sacrificial issues as well. Different people do, and that's really not the debate that I'm looking for here. What I'm looking at right now is the fact that the priesthood was corrupted. Now, it is obvious, is, as we noticed earlier, Jason, once he took over from his brother uh, on, uh, Onias III, he corrupted the covenants and he uh, brought in a lawlessness according to what is written in the documented history. And this is the priesthood was being corrupted. So the question is, is what did he corrupt? That's not really known here. That's not our point in this particular broadcast. My point that I'm wanting to establish with you here is who is sitting on the place of the Zadokite priesthood today. And that's what we're working to get to now. Let's move on. The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Christian Origins by Joseph Fitzmaier says the Jews who wrote the sect uh, sectarian literature founded in the Qumran caves often refer to themselves as the B'nai Tzadokik Hakonim, which is the sons of Zadok, the priest. Okay, so this was another evidence that the Qumran was known as the Zadokites, uh, the priesthood there from Zadok, uh, Zadok, uh, uh, Zadok, who was actually uh, the, you know, as it's saying here, the B'nai Zadok, the sons of Zadok, is evidently the descendants from uh, Zadok that was anointed by David uh, to be the high priest, uh, a true uh, Levitical uh, descendant of Aaron. All right. Oh, by the way, too, I, I don't know if I mentioned this in this article or not. This Josephus mentions too that during this time frame, about two two hundred years BC, before the coming of our Lord, uh, Josephus says that that God stopped using the Urim uh, that it that the the anointing of that had begun to to cease. Uh, and it's right around the time frame that uh, Onan, Onias was taking out from being the high priest, the last true, uh, not so much true descendant of Sadok, uh, next to the last, Jason was the last, but the true last one that was still holding to the truths of what the Sadok priests were teaching. Uh, but anyway, it goes on here in Bible history, Minela, Minelas had no sympathy for the Jewish traditions whatsoever. And he's the one that re replaces Jason. And this is where the whole dynasty of the priesthood is now broken. It says, uh, he was only concerned about his own power. The temple treasury did not contain enough money to pay Antiochus of Epiphanes, is who it's speaking of, what he had promised. So he sold some of the holy vessels of the temple to raise the money he needed. It was now the goal that Judaism was to be destroyed, and the mind of Antiochus to be unhellenized was stiff-necked nonsense. If Judaism stood in the way, then Judaism was to be destroyed, so he gave the orders. Sounds like Hitler's working back during uh, when Pope Pius the, uh, 
what was it, the 12th, I believe, that, that worked under his authority. Kill the Jews, why not? The Syrian army marched in Jeru Jerusalem, and many of the people were killed, and others escaped to the hills. Only the known uh, Hellenists were allowed to remain. Okay, so orders were given. No Sabbath, no holy days, no circumcision. A statue of Zeus Antiochus was placed in the temple above the altar. The most detestable animals, the pig, were brought and sacrificed on the altar, and the abominable act was perpetrated on Kislev, the 25th, 168 B.C., according to the book of Maccabees that left the Jewish people desolate. Uh, they called this the abomination uh, in Daniel, but uh, Yeshua taught that this was a preliminary occurrence of a greater fulfillment coming in the last days during the 70th week of Daniel. And uh, very interesting, though, but remember, though, if this is what they did there, uh, and by the way, that statue of Zeus is the statue of what? Jupiter. So in the last days, we already have the Pope of Rome putting the statue of Jupiter in, in, in his temple. But what's going to happen when they go to build a third temple in Israel? As I've stated before, the property just outside the Mount Zion's gate there when you go down and you start to go down the hill there, once you get to the main road there, all that property is owned by the Vatican. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they don't end up trying to build a temple there. Anyway, moving right along though. The Messianic Seal of Jerusalem Church, a book written by Reuven Ephraim Schmaltz and Raymond Robert Fisher. Quote from their book here says, The Maccabees are remembered in history as the national heroes. It's just a comment I make in, in INL, which is Israel National, Israeli News Live. Note is it was a 25-year battle with the Greeks, and the end they in the end they win, and the story of Hanukkah is born, the eight days of lights. So that's the Maccabean story there. But anyway, I just want to put that in the middle of uh, what uh, these men were writing in their book. They were known as national heroes. What again is barely noticed by historians is that in two infamous acts. These heroes caused havoc and division in the nation and set the pace for the coming destruction and 2,000-year exile. And they did. The major thing they did was make the covenant with Rome. Maccabees did just that. In 152 BCE, Jonathan the Maccabean took the high priest's office to himself. And in the early years of his successor, Simon the high priest transferred irrevocably from Zadokites to the Hasmonean uh, dynasty. And this was the true breaking of Israel right there. Uh, them making a covenant with Rome is the second part of it, but they actually, when they totally annulled the Zadokites, uh, the sons of Zadok, of uh, being the priest of Israel, the high priest of Israel, this totally spiraled everything out of control for Israel at that point there. The Maccabees, they did a wonderful thing in setting the children of Israel free from, from the uh, Greek empire. If they had have restored back uh, the true priesthood, we may have had a different history altogether. But we know that it was not meant to be that way. Let's look at the book of Maccabees itself for some of the answers. So Judas chose uh, excuse me, Eupolaminus, son of John, son of Echos, and Jason, son of Eliezer, and sent them to Rome to establish friendship and alliance. You know, this, I mean, history is repeating itself, friends. Here we are, the Maccabee brothers, they send to Rome to establish a friendship and alliance. This is what Shimon Peres did in 1993 and 1994. And to free themselves from the yoke, for they saw that the kingdom of the Greeks was enslaving Israel completely. They went to Rome, a very long journey, and they entered in the Senate chamber and spoke as follows. Judas, who is also called Maccabeus, and his brothers and the people of the Jews have sent us to you to establish alliance and peace with you so that we may be enrolled as your allies and friends. That is the oldest NATO covenant on record. People say that Israel's not part of NATO. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. The NATO alliance was first formed by the Roman Empire with the Jewish people, the Israelis of that day there. Let's look on to what it says here. That's why I wrote in here on 1 Maccabees chapter 8, verses 23 through 29. Sounds like a NATO member, so Israel is the longest standing NATO member today. All right. 
because Rome is, the empire is still is reestablished. NATO is their military force. Remember, the two keys on the, on the Catholic flag represent both spiritual and political powers, and they claim to rule the entire world, both spiritually and politically. So therefore, as Pope John Paul II said in 1996, New York is the capital of the world. What did he mean by that? The United Nations, his military arm of the world, is right there in New York. So that's the world's capital. Got that in there? Watch what happens with the Roman Empire back here, back uh, 2,200 years ago. May all go well with the Romans and with the nation of the Jews at sea and on land forever. And may sword and enemy be far from them. If war comes first to Rome or to any of their allies in all their dominion, the nation of the Jews shall act as their allies wholeheartedly, as the occasion may indicate to them. To the enemy that makes war, they shall not give or supply grain, arms, money, or ships, just as Rome has decided. And they shall keep their obligations without receiving any return. In the same way, if war comes first to the nation of the Jews, the Romans shall willingly act as their allies, as the occasion may indicate to them and to their enemies, there shall not be given grain, arms, money, or ships, just as Rome has decided, and they shall keep these obligations and so do without deceit. Thus, in these terms, the Romans make a treaty with the Jewish people. That is the biggest NATO covenant I have ever seen. If that ain't nothing but the whole case of sanctions, I don't know what sanctions are then. Rome started it. Israel signed on with it. This is why there's no need of a treaty really between Israel and the Catholic Church. They've already got one. And Shimon Perez authenticated that. You know, I had a, a dear uh, brother, sister that wrote me just recently uh, that's actually in Israel right now as we speak. And they said to me, that when they, they owned a business there, I won't say what it was, but they owned a business there in Israel. And they, they told me how that the Catholic people would come to their restaurant. And when they would come to their restaurant, they learned all kinds of things. But one shocking uh, moment that happened for them was with one Catholic priest from, from, I think, South Africa had came up, or South America, one, I forget which one it was, and he declared that the Palestinians are going to get everything that they're asking for. Well, they were blown away by this because of being Jewish. And they said, that, that's not possible. It's not so. They said, oh, yes, it is. You will see. Mark my words. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. The priest is right. Just as it was told to me by one of the uh, uh, United Nations members there in the Golan that, that clearly uh, let me know that the Golan would not be under Israeli control in the very near future. Moving on, Orthodox rabbinic statement on Christianity. Now, I bring this out here, and why do I bring this out? Because this, again, is the... the you got to remember now... Oh, oh gosh, let, let's back up now. The Hasmonean Empire is the new priest of today, right? The Hasmoneans. The Hasmoneans were established by the Maccabeans. Okay, the Maccabee brothers. They were not the true Levites. And the same thing that we have today, and I don't mean this in no disregards to my Jewish brethren. I love you dearly. You are my brother nonetheless. But it's the Zadokites are the true lineage to Levi, not the Hasmonean dynasty that was started by the Maccabee brothers. And they're the ones that went and made a covenant with Rome. And this is what you see in the picture on your screen now. This is a Hasmonean Orthodox rabbis sitting with the Pope of Rome, making a covenant just like they did back in history 2,200 years ago. We recognize and since the Second Vatican Council of the official teaching of the Catholic Church about Judaism have changed fundamentally and irrevocably. And the promulgation of Nostra Aetate 50 years ago started the process of reconciliation between our two communities. Reconciliation is bringing something back together that once was. So they had a covenant originally, didn't they?
They're reconciling. I mean, I may be wrong in the definition on that, but to me, a reconciliation, when you're reconciling with someone, it's because you had a relationship prior to that. So if they're reconciling their difference with the Catholic Church, they had a relationship prior to it, and that relationship was set up by none other than the Maccabee brothers, who was the high priest of Israel at that time, falsified high priest, not the true Zadokite priestly, uh, priest, uh, uh, priestly lineage, but the false one, and they made the covenant with Rome, so they're reconciling that covenant, okay? The Nostra Aetate, the, the later official church document, inspired unequivocally, reject any form of anti-Semitism, affirm the eternal covenant between God and the Jewish people, reject the cited and stressed the unique relationship between Christians and Jews who were called our elder brothers by Pope John Paul II and our fathers of faith by Pope Benedict XVI. Unbelievable. Let's move right along. The history is going to repeat. Rome, as we know, is Mystery Babylon. All right? This is under religious riots on PBS.org. Okay? Religious riots. PBS.org puts this out. Furious at the discretion, the Jews tore them out of violence, erupted. Philo writes of how mobs of men killed Jews and set fire to the Jewish properties. Now, this is back during the uh, when the Greeks were ruling over Israel during now Philo's time, by the way, this is this is when this is during the time when the uh, I'm sorry, this is when the covenant. I'm sorry, my apology. Philo was during the covenant of Rome is already there, but the Greeks were coming in and causing all these problems. Mobs of men killed Jews and set fire to the Jewish properties. But you know what? The Romans, even though they had an alliance with Israel, and remember what the covenant was they made. This was under the Maccabean covenant here. See? If a war comes first to Rome or to any of their allies and any of all their dominion, the nation of the Jews shall act as their allies wholeheartedly. Going on down in the same, in the same way, if a war comes first to the nation of the Jews, the Romans will, shall willingly act as their allies. You think they're acting as their allies? No, they're not. And they didn't honor it back then, and they don't honor it today either. So Philo writes of how mobs of men killed Jews and set fire to Jewish property. Does that remind you of anything today? As we see in the, the, the photograph here, now the, the fire is just burning. That's not the property, but believe me, they do throw Molotov cocktail at Jewish houses and burn them and kill them and stab them. And kill, and it's a war against the Jews, and yet the Romans don't honor their covenant just like they didn't do uh, 2,200 years ago back during the time when Philo was here. He said, watch what he says. Only emperors could resolve situations this big, and unfortunately, Caligula, didn't care, and a group of Jewish leaders, including Philo, left Alexandria for Rome to see if the emperor and make their case. However, Philo, just like Pope Francis today, wrote that he knew the trip was pointless as soon as they entered Caligula's presence. He didn't care. In fact, they were worried about being murdered right there in Rome. You know, you remember it was Jean Toron the Cardinal of the Vatican, the head of the religious dialogue that in 2011 stated that if the holy sites are not all resolved and given over to the Vatican, there will be no peace in Jerusalem, inciting the violence himself with his own mouth. And he's the mouth of the Pope himself. And that's exactly what happened. Anyway, that was uh, International Business Times is where that photograph comes from there, the Palestinian mobs. Mystery Babylon sits on seven hills of Rome. Don't forget this now, friends. Micah chapter 4, verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail, for now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. See, there shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemy. Now remember, mystery Babylon is the Catholic Church of today. She sits on seven hills. Oh, some people want to say Mecca sits on seven hills. Okay, please, wake up. Wake up. You know, do you know that's nothing but the Catholic Church trying to hand you a, a, a Muslim Mahdi to give you as an antichrist, and you've got people out there all kinds of so-called Christian people running around pur uh, purporting that 
uh, different Arabs are now the Antichrist. And they keep changing the guy, too. They can't nobody make up their mind who the Antichrist is. Now, John said there's many Antichrists already coming to the world. That's why. Because why? The papacy would be many, many Antichrists. All right? But it's not some Muslim guy. Get this out of your head. All right? Because what, what, what did Philo, what did he deal with? See? And a group of Jewish leaders, including Philo, left Alexandria for Rome to see the emperor and to make their case. They, they're trying to go to Rome to resolve it. Who was the one that was heading the negotiations for the peace effort to bring about a Palestinian state, a two-state solution? It was the Pope of Rome. And when Israel didn't just come along and bow down and beg him for their agreement, the Pope just declared them a state. I mean, come on, wake up. You don't think the man is not ruling the world? Sure he is. You remember the big picture, the big shindig, Shimon Perez goes to the Vatican and Mahmoud Abbas goes to the Vatican and all the Arab delegations come there and, and they have their photographs taken out there on the lawn and, and this was all about the Pope helping to get the, the two-state solution regenerated, get it restarted again. You know, it wasn't seeming to do very good with John Kerry with his nine-month negotiation. No, the nine-month negotiation happened. The nine-month negotiation was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Rebecca when she said there were two nations in her womb, or she went to the Lord to find out why the, the twins were fighting in her womb. And the Lord, the, the angel, the Lord said to her, there are two manner of peoples in your womb. There are two nations in your womb. All right? And when they come forth, they will be divided. That was a prophecy of the negotiations that were going to happen in this day. Esau and Jacob fighting with one another. Now, it looks like that, that the two-state solution is really about the Palestinians and the Jews. It's not. The Palestinians are just being used by the Vatican, as it says in the book of Daniel. He comes up strong with a small people. That small people are the Palestinians. You, you Palestinian people, you're just being used by the Vatican. You are nothing but a pawn in their chess game. And so when they couldn't get the Jewish uh, prime minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu, to go along with this two-state solution, they just went ahead and declared it's, uh, the second state. You know, the Pope is not going to sit around and wait for Israel to make up their mind. They consider that they run the world. So they just went and declared a Palestinian state. Why? Because the Vatican wants to take care of all their stuff. They want The Vatican's not going to wait for, for, for Prime Minister Netanyahu to come along and agree to a second state. The Vatican has got to move forward his plans for the Pope to rule the world. They don't have a whole lot of time. They know Planet X is coming, so they got to get things in order. Oh, my God. So what happens? The Jews go even to Babylon. See, what is, what's going on? Why are you in pain and labor, Israel, to bring forth like a woman in travail? Is there no king in you? See, Prime Minister Netanyahu was anointed to be king over the Israeli people, but it didn't work. That's what God's saying. There's no king in you. Has your counselor perished? Yes, you killed your Messiah. He was murdered, not just by the Jews. I don't want to put, don't put this on the Jews. Let me tell you something. It was the Romans that did the dirty work. They were the executioner. So Rome is guilty. And all of you out there that think that, you know, that this is exactly what we needed. You know, if the Jews, if, 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 the, <laughs> It's like the Zadokite priests. The Zadokite priests, they, as, as it was written in there, they didn't want to do the sacrificial uh, offerings of animals. They believed in an offering, yes, the pure, pure oblation. That was their way of doing it. You know, they, they were totally different than what the uh, Hasmonean priests were doing. They were the ones killing the animals and stuff. So if, if Yeshua, and I do believe that Yeshua was a sacrifice. I do believe that. I believe that he gave his own life, but in, but in essence, he was still murdered. Because if this is what God wanted, and He does come, Yeshua does come, and He redeems. He redeems us. He buys us back. Satan has control of the world. So Yeshua gave His own blood to redeem us back. But it's still, in the sight of God, was a murder as well. He gives His life willingly, but they did kill Him. And you can't get out of that. Because if it was, if it was something that God was just longing for the blood of his son, and that everything would have been nice and kosher, then the Israelites should have never went into captivity. Then in that case, they did God a service by uh, killing Yeshua and having him uh, put, on, put on the altar to be killed. 
Okay, a different story altogether, but let's move on now. Constantine, see, he's not the only one that banned books, by the way. Let's read right here. According to the Maccabees, Antiochus banned many traditional Jewish and Samaritan religious practices. He made possessions of the Torah a capital offense and burned the copies he could find. Sabbath and feast were banned. Catholic Church also banned the Sabbath. Did you know that? Historically speaking, if you tried to keep the Sabbath, you were burned. Not just the Jews. All the early Christians that were still keeping the Sabbath the Catholic Church burn them for doing it. They change the religious practice. They, they, uh, the possession of the Torah, a capital offense. Mm. This is what Antiochus did. Oh, by the way, Antiochus was not Constantine, though. I've got the wrong picture there. My apology for that. Why Christians were denied access to their own Bible for a thousand years? Now, there's a lot of sources out there already that talk about how that they, they burned all the, they burned many of the ancient books. We know they didn't burn them all because they, they kept, they have a lot of them down in the Catholics' uh, secret vaults and archives. But the Huffington Post did this article here on July 20th of 2013. The Council of Nicaea called by the Emperor Constantine met in 325 CE. Oh, well, that's why I had Constantine's picture there. Besides the Greeks doing it, also Constantine did it too as well with the Catholic Church. In 325 CE established a unified Catholic Church. At that point, no, universal, no universally sanctioned scriptures or Christian Bible existed. Various churches and officials adopted different texts and gospels. That's why the Council of Hippo sanctioned 27 books for the New Testament in 393 CE. This is why I always say the church fathers never quote from the canon we have today. They didn't have our canon. There, there were many different books that were written. Um, anyway, it says that's not what happened. The church actually discouraged the populace from reading the Bible on their own. A policy that intensified through the Middle Ages and later with the addition of a prohibition forbidding translations of the Bible into native languages. The fate of William Tyndale in 1536 CE, or AD, after, you know, after the death of Yeshua, William Tyndale was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. According to Tyndale, the church forbid owning or reading the Bible to control and restrict the teachings and to enhance their own power and importance. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because what was going on with the Greek Empire continued on in the Roman Empire. And you see it all the way to 1536, in fact. They were burning people for translating the Bible into the common people's language. There's been a control all along. All along there's been control of what they want you to know. Let's look, let's go, let's take a little bit, let's take a step back and go back to 2 Samuel. That's where we started off in our broadcast here. We're getting, getting close to the end now. 2 Samuel 15, 13, And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said unto David, excuse me, unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord king shall appoint. That's a lot like the way Yeshua's disciples were. They were willing to fight for him to set up his kingdom. But he said this wasn't the way God had intended it. He knew that he was going to die. He knew that he would give his life. Because that redemption had to take place. Even though they murdered him, they had to do it. It had to be the work of the kinsman redeemer. Okay? So anyway says on, And the king went forth and all his household after him, and the king left ten women which were concubines to keep the house. And the king went forth and all the people after him and tarried in a place that was, uh, where it was far off. Now, notice, their, all their eyes, all the people's eyes had, had begun to, they were now on Absalom. That was David's own son, though. His name literally means Avshalom in Hebrew. It means, My father is peace. And this is what's happening today. This is what got me started on this whole story here, was from Abigail, 
noticing something similar to this here, and I'll get to that in just a moment, what Abigail notices there uh, in the story of David there. But see, Absalom wanted his father's throne, but it wasn't his. It wasn't the way it was intended. And David had already promised it to Bathsheba, to Solomon. But Absalom put himself up there. He elevated himself to a position that didn't belong to him. It's the same thing with the popes of Rome. They've elevated themselves to a position that they don't belong in. And, they, and the, people, the, the eyes of the people of the world are upon Pope Francis as he's someone great. All right? So the history is repeating itself. And the king left ten women which were concubines to keep the house. That is an interesting thing there. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now remember, a concubine is, an, is a wife that's not had a proper marriage yet. She's a, she's a common law wife. In other words, David's taken her for a wife, but they haven't had a, an official marriage ceremony. Well, that's kind of interesting because Yeshua speaks about the ten virgins. And when David leaves behind his ten concubines, he tells them to care for his house in his absence. And I do believe that that's a sign to the Christian people of today. Uh, if you, whether you call yourself Christian or whether you're, you're just a believer in Yeshua, I'm a believer in Yeshua. Uh, I like that better than putting a title on myself. But uh, as a believer in Yeshua... God has given us a charge as his ten virgins, and I prefer to be on the wise side of those virgins, to care for his house in his absence. Like David, Yeshua is just like David. He left, he went over the city, and he wept too. It goes on to say, And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook of Kidron. And all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness, and Zadok also, and the Levites were with him. This is interesting. Watch it. The reason I'm bringing this out is because of the Zadokite priest, priesthood. They were bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God, and they set down the Ark of God. And Abathar went up until the people and had done passing out of the city. And the king said unto Zadok, Carry back the Ark of God into the city. It shall, and if I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. The king said also unto Zadok the priest, Art not thou a seer? In other words, a prophet. Return into the city in the peace, and your two sons with you, Ahimaaz thy son, and Jonathan the son of Abithar. See, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. And Zadok before, therefore and Abathar carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they tarried there. And David went up to the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up, and he, as his head covered, he went up barefoot, and all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they, wept, and they went up weeping as they went up. Now what's interesting in this as well, those two sons of the priest. The priest, Zadok, reminds me, in this case here, of the Holy Spirit. And the two sons remind me of the two witnesses. I think that's interesting. But also we know that Yeshua too crossed that Kidron Valley and wept over Jerusalem, says, Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know, this is why Yeshua was rebuking all these priests here. They were not the true Zedekite priesthood. The true Zedekite priesthood was out in the desert. And I believe that his apostles, and, and that they come from those lineages. I know it's different tribes, you know, I understand that. But anyway, anyway, the two witnesses like Ahimaaz and Jonathan stand before the God of the whole earth, the ark uh, representation. In 2 Samuel, we see there, Behold, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abathar's son, and by them you shall send unto me everything that you can hear. So Hushai, uh, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Now, notice also Revelations 11, 3 through 4. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three scold days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's why I say 
They're just like the two witnesses. The battle is for the throne of David, though. And this is what we're getting down to. Yet a man has risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. Now this is from the story of Abigail. Now, Abigail is actually prophesying this to David. Yet a man has risen to pursue thee, to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God, and the souls of thine enemies. Them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. But there is someone. Saul was the one that was after his throne. And even today, when it comes to being the kings over Israel, the Pope of Rome is there to take the throne all away from Benjamin Netanyahu. But you see, the Pope of Rome is not just interested in Netanyahu's seat. He's interested in taking the throne of David. We'll go into that. It says on here in the book of Saul, Samuel, Saul like Aaron gave to the people. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken to the fat of rams. Now, I'm bringing this out here because remember, Saul, Saul had been anointed by Samuel to be the king of Israel, but God had to have Samuel go and anoint David. Why? Because Saul failed to keep the commandments of the Lord. Watch what he does. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice and obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Didn't Aaron do the same thing? He feared as well and obeyed the voice of the people, and ended up making a golden calf out there in the desert. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, will not, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Now he didn't reject him as a son of Israel, but he wasn't going to be allowed to rule his people. And the Catholic Church has done the same thing. Now, John defines the Antichrist and as one that was among them, as basically a believer of Yeshua. Let's real quick look at this. Um, Bert, let's go to the second one there. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. No, let me start. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. See, David did the will of God, but not Saul. And neither is the papacy doing the will of God. So though they may have abided a long time, they're not going to abide forever. Little children, is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, where, excuse me, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Who went out from them? Those Antichrists. Those ones that were like Christ, but they're just a pseudo-Christ. So the Antichrist should not be some Muslim cleric or some Mahdi or, or it should not be Erdogan of Turkey or something like that. It's got to be someone that is from among us, among the believers of Yeshua. Because the Antichrist spirit was among the believers of Yeshua, not even the Jews. He's a believer. He would... He said they were from, they came, they were, they were, they went out from us because they were not of us. That they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But you have the unction from the Holy One and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. Now, I'm going to give you one on the Antichrist that you're not familiar with probably. And this is in the Apocalypse of Thomas. Watch what he says here. 
For there shall be great disturbances throughout all the people and death. The house of the Lord shall be desolate, and their altars shall be abhorred. So that spiders weave their webs therein. The place of the holiness shall be corrupted. The priesthood polluted. Distress, agony shall increase. The priesthood polluted? Thomas writes that the priesthood would be polluted. The, the priesthood was already polluted by the Maccabees when they exalted themselves into the, into the Hasmonean dynasty of priests, which were not the true Levites. But Thomas is saying the priesthood would be polluted. The holiness shall be corrupted and the priesthood polluted. That's the Vatican. See, they claim to be the priest of today. They claim to carry on the work of Peter and of James, Yeshua's own brother. He said, Agony shall increase, virtue shall be overcome, joy perish and gladness depart. In those days evil shall abound. There shall be respecters of persons. Him shall cease out of the house of the Lord. Truth shall be no more. Covetousness shall abound among the priests, an upright man, an upright priesthood shall not be found. Hmm. Covetousness shall be, be, be shall abound among the priest. There's your priesthood. I took that picture myself. There's your priesthood. John Paul II as we mentioned earlier, play uh, the capital of the world. He claims it to be the New York City. As I said earlier, too, uh, this is on archives of Rudolph uh, W. Giuliani, State of the City. It's on his governor website. In my inaugural address, I said New York City was the capital of the world. Since that time, many people in, from other cities have disputed my claim. They have written me letters complaining about my usurping the title capital of the world for the New York City. But last year in October the 7th speech in Central Park, Pope John Paul II himself consecrated New York City as the capital of the world. So let me just say to those that dispute our claim, if you've got a problem with New York City being the capital of the world, take it up with the Pope. This is why it's the capital of the world. Remember, as I said, the two keys on the flag Vatican's flag represent temporal and spiritual powers. He is the head of both political governments of the world as well as spiritual churches and all religions of the world. You know, recently Lisa Haven did an article and she spoke about uh, the, the, all the worlds coming together with a one world religion and they were doing this thing amongst the youth and they said the papacy was made the head of their world religion. No wonder. They're the head, the head of the world of everything. Pope Francis takes Yeshua's seat. This is where we're coming down to, friends. I, I want to show you the correlation between history and what's been going on with the papacy as well. So you kind of get where I'm going to with this. The Messianic Seal of Jerusalem Church, in the book that's written there, it says there, it stands to reason that the Zadokites who controlled the Essene Quarter and the holy site, who had previously prepared the upper room, the long-awaited Messiah from the house of David, had come to his throne. Now they're speaking. He's writing about. Um, uh, let me let me let me clarify something here for you that you will not know about this book here. Do I even have that book here around me somewhere? I thought I did. Yes, I do. Let me share with you the book I'm speaking about right here. This is the book right here. Uh, the Messianic Seal of the Jerusalem Church. This book here was written uh, based on the discoveries that were made there on Mount Zion where St. James's Church was actually found. The Jewish antiquity authorities, they confiscated the artifacts that were there. Many of them were there. Of course, the author of the book was able to keep many of these for himself. Uh, he did a lot of research on Mount Zion and there is clear evidence that the tomb of David on Mount Zion really is where David is buried. Now, there is a Catholic archaeologist that disputes that, historian, whatever you want to call him, 
I forget his name, but he claims that it's further down the hill, closer to, in other words, where the Vatican's church is there. That's where he claims it is. We know that he's lying about it. I say that because the Pope of Rome has proved otherwise in his own actions. But the upper room in that case there is literally there where the tomb of David is. There's a lot of artifacts, historical documentation. He definitely goes through that in this book, The Messianic Seal of, Jerusalem, of the Jerusalem Church. And he clearly identifies that this is where the uh, St. James actually had his church at. I've been there. I've shared the video with you of the footage there of that actual place there. It's kept away from the public. It's not a place you can easily go to unless you know where it's at. Um, and this is why the Pope of Rome went there to the upper room. And we're going to speak about that here in just a second. Now, I want to share with you, though, I, I brought this up from his book there. It stands to reason that the Zadokites who controlled the Essene Quarter, and it was called the Essene Quarter. There is actual historic documented evidence that speaks about this being the Essene Quarter. And the holy site, and who had previously prepared the upper room, the long-awaited Messiah from the house of David, had come to his throne. Speaking of Yeshua, in other words, he writes about how that they knew that Yeshua was coming, and it was, it was prepared for him because it was a safe place for the Messiah to go to uh, without running into the Hasmonean priesthood that was in opposition to the Zadokite priesthood. All right, now St. James was there. Now, here's what's interesting. The Pope of Rome knows that this place is that important as well. Don't think the Catholic Church doesn't know it. They have been given all of Mount Zion. That was one of the main disputed areas was Mount Zion. Now see, this is what's interesting. And I, wouldn't, I didn't put this in here. I wasn't planning on talking about this. But, you know, I don't know if it was a year or so, how long ago it was, maybe two years now. When the Lord dealt with me in a dream, and I seen on Mount Zion, all the Orthodox rabbis were out there praying. And I began to pray right along with them. And I, and I laid myself on the earth to pray. And as I did, I looked up in front of me. There was a huge stone there. And suddenly, in the Hebraic language, written came across there, written like an amber fire just wrote on the stone. And so there's a man drinking upon my holy mountain. And then it went away. And then words came across again the second time, and it said, and you are to remove him. I got up from there in this dream, and I began to walk through the crowd of people there, the, the Orthodox rabbis that were there praying, some with their hands up praying, some knelt down praying. And suddenly there was a man, he had his back to me, but he knew I was coming. And as he saw, or he perceived that I was coming, whatever you want to call it, Suddenly I saw that chalice come out and he just took it and he poured the wine out on the ground. And he said, I'm not drinking anymore. And I said, I don't care. I said, you have to leave this mountain. And he said a strange thing to me. He says, for how long? And I, I didn't know what to answer. I said, I don't know. I said, but you must leave. Now, I came out of the dream. I have no idea what the dream means. I don't... I don't presume anything, but it's interesting. And the funny thing is, this mountain right there, Mount Zion, and literally, when I went back there after having the dream, the, the, the whole area had been cleared off where it was once like Broom Sage Field, and the rocks that were there, and it looked like what I saw in the dream. And that was weird because it wasn't like that originally. They'd made like a little park area where you can sit down at, things like that. Now, Notice what Giulio Miotti wrote in one of his articles here. This was on uh, February 1st, 2013. He writes here, A seat for the Pope at King David's tomb. Historical agreement has been drafted between Israel and the Vatican. The Israeli authorities have granted the Pope an official seat in the room where the Last Supper is believed to have, been, have taken place, on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and where David and Solomon, Jewish kings of Judea, are considered by some researchers to also be buried. The Vatican was given this area. No referendum by the people. Even the rabbi that was over the tomb of David, I asked his secretary for an audience with him, and they were fearful. 
because of whatever they went through, the persecution they went through. I guess they're afraid of losing that spot. We know that the Vatican has so much authority that they were able to throw the Jews out of the tomb of David so the Vatican could hold even a, a communion service inside David's tomb. But when the Pope of Rome came there in 2014, it paved the way. Once he was given that official seat in 2013, February the 1st, a year later, Pope Francis comes to Israel. An official visit there to the upper room, fulfilling Obadiah's prophecy, verse 16, where it speaks about that they will drink upon my holy mountain, and all the nations will continue to drink, and they will swallow down. It's in the masculine plural in Hebrew when it first speaks about it, and it was men only in this delegation that you see here where they come to drink there on God's holy mountain. And let's see here. You don't get to see it very well. You can only see the bottom half in your picture there. But Pope Francis is wearing his triple crown, his fish god hat, in this particular picture here. Why is he wearing it? He doesn't wear it the entire time, but the reason why he puts this crown on is to show that he is symbolic, the king of Israel. He was declaring, by putting on this crown, he was declaring that he is the son of David. He's come to the throne of David and put on his crown to declare that he is the son of David, and he is not the son of David. Isaiah 31, 4. For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called from against forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight from Mount Zion for the hill thereof. Why? Because of delegations like this one here where the Pope of Rome and his evangelical delegation, Tony Palmer, who claimed to be Elijah, of one of the two witnesses of Revelation. Well, I guess that didn't pan out unless they got him alive somewhere and nobody knows about it. Isaiah 24, 23 states, The moon shall be a confounded, the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. The Pope of Rome is not the Lord. He has no business. He should have never put a crown on his head and went to the upper room and sat there to do a communion service. When he did that, he had effectively claims to be the God of heaven. He desecrated Mount Zion when he went there. Friends, I have never seen in all my life more proof for the Antichrist than when the Pope of Rome went to Mount Zion. The official seat of David was given to him there. People look for a Jewish Antichrist. There's your Jewish Antichrist. When you make the Pope of Rome effectively the King of Israel, you've made him a Jew. So if you're looking for a Jewish Antichrist, there you go. If you're looking for your Muslim Mahdi Antichrist, well, you forget he is a descendant of Esau, according to the book of Obadiah. Esau's descendants are the Romans, even according to the book of Daniel. There's your two witness of the fact that they are Esau's descendants. And Esau, by the way, has done nothing his entire life and genealogy but marry in amongst the Arabic people. So yes, he is an Arab as well. And he's uniting the world's religions. What further do you need to look? Stand with us, if you would. We do need your support and your help in this mission to get the truth out. I'm Stephen Benoon, a prophetic segment of Israel News Live.